to do that. So um, <clears throat> I worked out a solution where I can actually walk around the room, which is what I like to do with my new iPad, and give the lecture from my iPad. So that's going to be a change for me. You're going to see me doing some adjustment. Hopefully this all works. And so you'll actually have two different videos. You can have a video if you actually physically want to see me. And if you really don't want to see any more of my face than necessary, which I can't blame you for, then you'll be able to watch the screen capture video. Uh, so uh, I'm going to put them both out there for right now. One of them is sort of serving as a backup in case the other one screws up. So that's kind of where uh, I'm coming uh, with stuff. This is a new thing for me. Um, and so um, I like my iPad. I, play, I actually had an earlier iPad before this one, so I've been playing with an iPad for a while. But I haven't tried to teach a class with it before, so that'll be a new challenge for me to, to do. Um, let's see. My name is Kevin, and um, I prefer to be called Kevin, so please don't call me Dr. Ahern. Some of you know me. Some I don't know all of you. Uh, but if you know me, you know I like to be called Kevin, so please do call me Kevin. Um, you're taking BB450. It's a class I've taught probably about a dozen times, so pretty familiar with the material. And I'm familiar with the challenges that students have, especially in the summer term. Uh, Summer term classes, if you haven't taken one before, are challenging in their, in their own right. Um, things are coming at about two and a half times the rate of a regular class. You're doing in four weeks what we do in a regular class in 10 weeks. And so having um, that on top of the fact that this material is fairly challenging means that you really need to stay focused. Okay? So that's very important. My job is to obviously present the material to you. My job is to help you to understand the material. Um, I'm very happy to help you in any way that I can uh, to, uh, in, in going through. Uh, and I'm going to break my rule here for a second and show you my calendar. Um, actually, no, I won't. Let's see if I can do that. Okay. So <coughs> if you look uh, on the um, class page, uh, which I don't even have the URL up there right now. I should pull that up for you. The class web page is actually right here. Okay? And if you go to that website right there, you'll be able to get, pull down the uh, syllabus from the class, which will tell you all the things that we're going to do, my expectations for you, et cetera. So it's important that you read the syllabus. Uh, I almost always have at least one question on the first exam that comes straight from the syllabus. So make sure you know what's in the syllabus. You are responsible for what's um, in, the, um, in the syllabus. So it's important uh, to, uh, to do that. Um, I forgot why I wanted to go to this in the first place. It wasn't the syllabus. Calendar. Calendar. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, if we go uh, to the other uh, portion of the class web page, which actually is shown right here, you'll see a link to my calendar. Okay? And my calendar is right here. You can always look at my calendar and see when I'm available. And you can see I have a pretty busy schedule. So um, today, for example, I had an HHMI meeting. I had this. I had that. Um, you're my priority. Okay? So even though I have a very busy schedule, okay, I, uh, if I am busy talking to somebody else and you need to talk to me, you will have priority. Okay? So remember that when you come by my office. So that if I can be of help to you, don't let my schedule be an impediment to you uh, getting help that you need. Uh, because I have a busy schedule, I run the HHMI program here at OSU over the summer. Because I have a busy schedule, I can be difficult to find, because I'm in meetings and so forth, this can help you to find where I'm at. And if I, my schedule doesn't jive very well with yours, then I'm happy to make appointments for you outside of class, after class or something like that, if that's helpful to you to learn the material. Okay? So don't let my schedule be a limit for you in terms of learning things. We actually have two teaching assistants uh, this year who uh, will be helping you in the summer. One is Anna Brar. I thought she was going to come, but I don't see her here. Um, Anna will be actually leading the recitation on Tuesday and Thursday. And Anna's job in the recitation is to um, work through problems. So what a lot of you will have difficulty with will be the math, the henderson hasselbach equation, which I'll talk about today, and things like that. And getting uh, on top of that is important. So Anna's job is to make sure that she works problems and answers questions for you. I've given her instructions. The first thing is she is to ask you when, she come, when you come to a recitation is, what questions do you have for her? So if you go prepared with questions for her, she can help you. The second TA that I have in the class is Claire Salberg. And Claire will not do the recitations. She will be grading exams, but she's also keeping office hours. 
And uh, if you look on the uh, class uh, web page, which actually was right here, you can see Claire's uh, office hours. Anna's not keeping office hours, but Claire will be available for answering questions um, at those times uh, and at that location. Uh, so as I always tell students, keep in mind that she's a free TA for you during those, those times. Uh, I mean a free of tutor, not TA, free tutor for you during those times. So if she can be of help to you, uh, take advantage of her as well. So that's uh, two sources of help for you besides me. Okay? Close my... Okay. All right. So um, you're a quiet group. This weather must have worn you out already. Um, what I'd like to do now is just spend a few minutes getting to know you a little bit, learning a little bit about what your plans are, career plans, and so forth. And that helps me to think a little bit about what is um, um, important for me to be covering for you. Okay. So um, let me just go through very briefly and ask you to tell me your name and your uh, major and whether or not you've had organic chemistry. If you haven't, I will let you in the class. It's not a requ well, it is a requirement, but I let you make that decision yourself. And what you hope to do with your career. So can I start with you? Yeah. Uh, my name is Evan. I'm majoring in chemistry and food science and taking lots of milk chem. Okay. And I want to be a brewer because I'm older. Okay. So you're in the enology group? Uh, fermentation science. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, I'm Charlotte. I'm in microbiology and I'm a PSF teacher. And I hope to be in the medical field. Okay. So you're pre-med. Okay. I'm Corgi, nutrition science, and I have taken it with him. And I want to be a nurse in the dark. Okay, good for you, good for you. Uh, I'm Matt, uh, I'm in microbiology as well, and I want to do something not medicine related. That's okay. all I know. And I have taken a lot of okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, knowing what you don't want to do is part of the process yeah. of learning what you do want to do. When I was your age, I knew a lot of what I didn't want to do, but it took me a long time to figure out what I did want to do. So, uh, how about you? Um, my name is Jackie Young, um, I'm a botany major, and I'm a Okay, okay, that's okay too. So, how about you? Uh, my name's Crystal. I'm microbiology. I have taken OCHEM and I'm thinking about med school. Okay, okay. So, a common interest, obviously. How about you? My name is Sarah and I'm majoring in biology and I've taken OCHEM and I'm studying med school. Yep, okay, Sarah, thanks. I'm Kenny. I'm pre dental. Pre dental? And I did take OCHEM. Okay, everybody's had OCHEM so far. How about you? Um, I'm Oh, good for you. Good for you. I'm Kyle. Uh, I'm microbiologist. Uh, I have taken it and I'm not sure exactly what I want to do yet. Okay, yeah. Good. I'm Mike. I'm major in chemistry and I'm Hi. Going to where after this? I'm sorry. Master's Good for you. I'm Nicole. I'm majoring in chemistry. I've taken a lot of OCHEM before and after this, it's master's and pre-med forensic science. Oh, okay. Pre-med forensic science. How do you do that? Um, I'm either or. I've got oh, it's an either or. Okay. Yeah. I, I never heard of pre-med. Right okay. okay. Keep your options. Keep the, all the doors open yep. for you. Good for you. How about you? My name is Chong. I'm a bio major. Um, I did both OCHEM and school. Okay. And I go to dental school. Okay. Good for you. Good for you. I'm Shamil. I'm a microbiome major and I've taken OCHEM and I'm pre med. Oh, I'm Roy. I was once a chemistry major and I was a bio biology major. Biology major, okay. Dental school. Dental school, okay, good. Um, I'm William. I'm a chemical engineering, engineering major. Um, I've taken OCHEM and uh, I plan on going into university of Tennessee. Okay, good for you. I'm Jacqueline, a zoology major. Okay, okay. Are you going to be pre-vet or something? Um, no, the other route. Like the other route, okay. Yeah, Go. Good, good for you. My undergrad degree was in zoology. Look what happened to me. <laughs> How about you? Uh, I'm Neil. I've definitely taken OCHEM, bio major, and I want to go to anesthesiology. Okay, good for you. 
I'm Yasmin. I'm a nutrition science major and pre-med and FK2 at Yorktown. Okay. I'm Chelsea. I'm also a nutrition science major, and I'm thinking about doing physician assistant. Physician assistant, okay. And, uh, physician assisted suicide, or? <laughs> no, no, no. Not that one, okay. And I'm thankful Oakland is better. Oh, well, hopefully you won't say the same thing about biochem <laughs> when it's done, so uh, <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see if we can do something about that. How, how about you? Med. Okay. I'm Anisia. Um, I have been in Oak County and I'm Okay. And how about you? I'm Fatima and I'm a nutrition science major and I'm a geology and I've taken Oak County. Okay. I'm Giovanna. My purpose for being in here is a master's in vet med. Right. And is there a statute of limitations on when you can go to town? No. Yes, and I took it. <laughs> we won't talk about when. <laughs> I, I actually had a student in my major uh, who came back to school after uh, 25 years. And he had, he had started college, uh, and then he got a job at HP. And HP uh, treated him very well until HP went through their merger. And then they had an incentive program to go back to school. And he sort of saw that, that, you know, that HP wasn't going to be there forever, so he went back to school. And this is the first time I ever encountered this. And the question was, uh, do, uh, is there a statute of limitations? And there's not. On undergraduate, uh, on graduate there is, but on undergraduate there's not a statute of limitations. So he had classes he had taken 25 years before that wisely he chose to take again because like the math he thought he probably didn't remember real well. Uh, but uh, amazingly enough that was the case. So, How about you? I'm Candace. I'm pre-med major. I have taken OCHEM and my hope is to go into Equine Orthopedics. Okay, good for you. Good for you. Equine or or Orthopedics. You'll probably be in demand at the, at the racetrack, huh? Yep. Yeah. How about you? I'm Christina. I'm in human development right now, but pharmacogenomics is looking more exciting than human development. Oh, excellent. And I have taken OCHEM. Okay. Pharmacogenomics, uh, exciting, uh, rapidly emerging uh, discipline. That's uh, <laughs> very cool. So you're going to have to have a biochemistry knowledge to do that. Good for you. How about you? Um, I'm Brittany. I'm microbiology, and I've taken OCHEM, but I'm not sure I'm going to take another. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm always, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an advisor for biochem students, so I always uh, get my students on this path, and I say, you know, it's okay to not know what you're going to do, but it's always good to have a plan. And I say that from, per, from personal experience. I was a zoology, I did get a zoology degree, but I went through my undergraduate years without a plan. And things turned out fairly well, but um, I made mistakes along the way not having a plan. I think having a plan and working towards a goal is very important. So um, even if you're not sure what you're going to do, I think it's, it's useful and important to... Um, uh, think about something that you really would like to do in that, in that process. Okay, well, what I'm going to do today um, is go through, if this would behave itself, there we go. Um, the very first part, a, a fairly general uh, description of biochemistry. The very first part, you won't be responsible at all. Uh, and then I'll get into the meat of the matter, which will include uh, Henderson Hasselbach equation and buffers and considerations about those. Those are important for us to understand because, as we will see as we get uh, talking about things in the course, that uh, buffers, aqueous solutions, and their pHs have significant effects on the charge of molecules. And as we will see, the charge of molecules, particularly proteins, has very, very important uh, implications for the function of those proteins. So we spend a fair amount of time at the very beginning talking about buffers, and a lot of that is actually done through the recitation. I'm going to go through some of the stuff here today. Anna will be going through some problems for you in the recitation uh, tomorrow. So that'll be uh, important to do. Okay, well, um, let's think about uh, biochemistry. When I say biochemistry, um, if the name itself doesn't incite fear in you, which it shouldn't, I hope it doesn't, uh, my aim is not scaring people, and um, I, uh, I really hope that what I can do with you is to cut through that fear that you have of the subject though I recognize people have certain anxieties about the subject and so forth. Uh, if I can help you to cut through that anxiety, I think that you will see that it's a fascinating topic that really is at the root of everything that is important in the life sciences. Okay. Everything in the life sciences is becoming molecular. You can't do anything in the life sciences without a molecular consideration. And that includes things as broad as ecosystems. You look at scientists working in ecosystems, and they're concerned about things at the molecular level. So there's no aspect of biology that escapes a molecular consideration. So it's very important that we spend some time going through this. Now, what I hope to do with you, there's going to be a lot of material to know, but what I hope to do with you in going through this is to give you a broad perspective 
of the significance and importance of this relative to your own physiology, relative to maybe animals or plants uh, that you're interested in working with. Because I think if you see those relevant components, you will look at this subject as something different than the way that you looked at organic chemistry, for example. The most common comment I get from people about organic chemistry is, wow, I'm sure glad I got out of that. Somebody in here said it, OK? Now, I don't want to say anything bad about organic chemistry, because we have to have organic chemistry to do biochemistry. But I want you to have an understanding, a, a biological understanding of the importance of this as part of what I'm going to do, OK? So if we look at the subject of biochemistry, the roots of biochemistry actually uh, come. I'm not used to this. There we go. OK. So the roots of biochemistry, uh, we think about things like, for example, chromosomes. Okay? Chromosomes are the genetic information. It's through chromosomes that all the proteins of a cell are made. And ultimately, every piece of information that a cell has to have uh, comes from those chromosomes. Okay? The roots of biochemistry are deeper than that, however. And when we look at biochemistry, the roots of biochemistry actually go back to the very first understandings of molecules. Right? When people first started, first started studying biology, they looked at an organism and they said, wow, there's such diversity of organisms. Okay? We've got plants, we've got animals, we've got horses, we've got dogs. Okay? There's something that's fundamentally different about them. And that was as far as we went. Okay? A horse is a horse, of course, of course. Right? Something is a horse is not a dog and it's never going to be a dog. Okay? And when people started dissecting organisms, they went down to a deeper level and they said, wow, well, an organism is really not just a dog or it's not really just a cat, but in fact, it is comprised of tissues. There's muscle, there's bone, there's blood, there's skin. So a dog is really the sum of the bone, of the muscle, of the intestines, of the skin, of the hair that the organism has. And that was a deeper understanding of what that organism was than to simply say, it's a dog. And when the microscope came around in about the 1600s, people were able to look at those tissues, and they look at those tissues, and what do they discover? Well, what they saw was muscle wasn't something that was just a component unto itself, but it was, in fact, comprised of individual cells. And so now the understanding about what a dog was went from muscle plus bone plus hair to, t to cells that make up muscle, and cells that make up bone, and cells that make up hair, and to other tissues. Okay? That was a big leap, because that gave rise to what we described as the fundamental unit of life, the cell. Okay? That was one of the most important uh, developments in the development of modern biology. Around about that time, chemistry got going pretty well. Lavoisier. Uh, did some great stuff with chemistry. Chemistry, people began to realize that there was an atomic basis for the things around us. Okay? The atmosphere had atoms, it had molecules, it had things in it that we couldn't see that were so small. Okay? And eventually, eventually, and this actually took quite a while, it wasn't until the 1930s, amazingly enough, that people started adding up one and one, and they said, well, of course, we know that there are molecules inside of cells, but it was in the 1930s that a man named Schrodinger first said okay, that the basis of everything that we see in biology is rooted in molecules. So even though there were people who were doing biochemical type things prior to the 1930s, it was in the 1930s that we can first point to this and say this was our first real realization that molecules were the basic root of life. Molecules were the basic root of life. Okay. Now, understanding that was very, very important because once we realized that there were the reasons that a dog was a dog and that a horse was a horse wasn't due to tissues. It wasn't due to cells per se, but rather it was due to the things comprising those cells. Molecules in those cells determined what those cells were. Right? Over the next 80 years, which brings us up to today, the, our knowledge about what's happening inside those cells has been nothing short of phenomenal. We know the metabolic pathways. 
metabolic pathways being the chemical reactions that make the molecules that are in us. We know the enzymes. We know the genetic material. Our knowledge of this is exploding. We are in what people describe as a golden age of biology. And in fact, we have a new component of biology that we call molecular biology. Because molecular biology tells us that molecules are the answer. If we understand molecules, we can understand everything that happens in biology. Now, that's a really cool thing. So I just told you this is important. This is cool. We should be smiling at this point. Because now we're going to know something important. We're going to know something cool, right? You get extra credit if you smile right now. So I see a lot of smiles. This is good. OK, so understanding that was very, very important uh, for us. OK. Um, the ultimate basis of knowledge at the molecular level is, of course, that of DNA. We think about DNA, and we hear a lot about DNA. As I say, these things I'm talking about now are very general. You're not responsible for them. DNA is the genetic material, something we memorize in, in probably grade school now. It's the genetic material. It's the information that's passed on from one generation to the next. And it's passed on because of chemical information. The information contained in the four bases that you see on the screen is the basis for every single biological process that happens on this planet and probably other planets as well. Okay? Those four bases, because of the information that those four bases are able to convey, okay, a living organism can be what it is. That's a pretty phenomenal thing. Forget this. There we go. Okay. Um, something we're going to spend a lot of time talking about are important chemical considerations about these biochemical molecules. Well, what's a biochemical? A biochemical is basically a chemical found in a living cell. When people first started studying biochemistry, which actually goes back into the 1800s, though I said a, a full understanding of it didn't really come into the until the 1900s. When people first started studying biochemistry, they said the following thing. The chemical reactions that occur in living cells are far too complicated for us to ever understand them. Never say never. Okay? We now understand virtually every important chemical reaction that occurs inside of cells virtually every important reaction that occurs inside of cells. And what we find as we've studied these is two things. One is that the reactions that occur in your cells are almost identical to the reactions that occur in dog cells, horse cells, plant cells. The metabolic pathways are almost identical. There's very, very little difference between them. Now, but those differences give rise to some very big differences between what a human being is, what a horse is, what a tree is. Okay? The second thing that we learned about this is that everything that happens in the chemical reactions in cells, there is nothing, zero, that's unique to the cell. Meaning that the same rules that govern chemistry in the rest of the universe govern the reactions that occur in our cells. It's very important to recognize that. There's nothing magical about a cell. Don't let anybody kid you. The same rules, the same energetics, the same mechanisms, the same reactions are occurring in reactions inside your cells as outside your cells. Now, there is some magic that occurs inside your cells, to be sure. The magic, as we will see, happens as a result of action of enzymes. And we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about enzymes. But the physical parameters, all the considerations of chemistry, are exactly the same inside the cell as they are outside the cell. One of the considerations we'll have talking about chemistry is that of hydrogen bonds. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about hydrogen bonds. So I want to start talking about hydrogen bonds right here. Hydrogen bonds are um, things that you learn at least a little bit about in freshman chemistry. I find that what most people learn in freshman chemistry is a little too little about some things, and this is one of them. If I say hydrogen bond to you, what's hydrogen? What, what does the term mean? What's, what's a hydrogen bond? Anybody? I won't bite you. Has anybody ever heard the term before? What's a hydrogen bond? It's what's on the screen, right? <laughs> okay. So a hydrogen bond is a bond between hydrogen and another atom. In simple terms, that's all it is. It's a bond between a hydrogen and another atom. And it's not, underline this not, it's not a covalent bond. 
Covalent bonds we write with those solid lines. Hydrogen bonds, we tend to use something like dots or dashes or something like that to indicate it's a different kind of a bond. But what is a hydrogen bond compared to a covalent bond? A covalent bond is a strong bond. If I want to break a covalent bond, I have to put a lot of energy in to break that covalent bond. The beauty of a hydrogen bond is it's a bond, but it's an easy to break bond. A very easy to break bond. Now we'll see why that's important later. Or actually, you'll see it in the 451 next term when you understand excuse me, how it is that DNA is replicated. What holds the two strands of DNA together? The only thing that holds the strands of DNA together are hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds. And you think, wow, such a weak force holding together something as important as my DNA. Is this good? It turns out, yeah, that's really good. Because cells have got to replicate that DNA. They've got to separate those strands. And if they had to break covalent bonds for every single base that was there, the cell wouldn't have enough energy to be alive. A weak hydrogen bond is much easier to break, and cells have the energy necessary to replicate DNA. So that's an important consideration. Okay. All right. Now, your book goes through this gyration about donor acceptor, et cetera, and we're not going to worry come on, about that for the most part. Basically, uh, a donor and acceptor means that there is something that has extra electrons. That's what you see right what you see right here. Oxygen has extra electrons. And hydrogen in the scheme tends to have fewer electrons. Okay? Why does that happen? Well, hydrogen bonds happen because of unequal sharing of electrons in covalent bonds. In freshman chemistry, you learn about electronegativity. And you learn that atoms like chlorine have a high electronegativity because they want to gain that electron to get an octet, uh, octet state. So they have a high affinity for electrons. They hold electrons close to themselves. Atoms like sodium have very low affinity because they want to lose that outermost electron. They want to give it up. So sodium chloride forms because chlorine takes away that electron from sodium, and sodium says, you can have it. And chlorine becomes negatively charged with that extra electron. And sodium becomes positively charged, having lost that electron. And that negative and that positive attract each other, and that makes sodium chloride. And that's all good. Okay. With hydrogen bonds, we don't gain or lose electrons. I want you to understand that. We don't gain or lose electrons. We have an uneven sharing of electrons. In this particular bond right here, nitrogen has a greater electronegativity than hydrogen. Nitrogen has a greater electronegativity than hydrogen. If this oxygen over here were bound to, let's say, another hydrogen, for example, as part of a water molecule, oxygen also has a greater neg electronegativity than hydrogen. Something that has a greater electronegativity is going to hold electrons closer to itself than hydrogen will. So there's an uneven sharing of the electrons there. We can think of the nitrogen in this case, or the oxygen as well, as being slightly more negative. It's not a full charge. We, it's what we call a partial charge. We use a little delta sign to, de to designate that partial charge. Well, if this guy has pulled electrons over here and it's slightly negative, that means that this guy is left being slightly positive. The hydrogen is slightly positive. Well, guess what? This slightly positive hydrogen is attracted to this slightly negative oxygen. And that's what the hydrogen bond is. The basis of the hydrogen bond is a difference in electronegativity. The reason that water has the properties that it does is because oxygen, great electronegativity, relatively negatively charged. Hydrogen, lesser, negative, le lesser electronegativity, more positively charged. So water is nothing but a mixture of all these partial negatives and all these partial positives attracting each other. Now you probably never thought about it before, but water is a liquid at room temperature. It has a molecular weight of 18. If molecular weight were the sole basis for whether something were a liquid, carbon dioxide should be a liquid. 
and it has a molecular weight of 44. No, it's more than that. Carbon, yeah, 44, right. okay? But carbon dioxide's a gas. Carbon dioxide has no hydrogen bonds. It has no attractive forces like hydrogen bonds that are helping to hold it together in the liquid state at room temperature. Hydrogen bonds lower boiling points. Because of hydrogen bonds, liquid, uh, water is a liquid at room temperature. OK. OK. Now, as we um, go through these discussions, we will later talk about thermodynamics. And again, I'm still not talking about things that we'll be responsible for yet. I'm just about to finish that up. Thermodynamics is something that you've learned a little bit about in freshman chemistry. And one of the things that you learn in thermodynamics is that disorder increases. And you learn that Gibbs free energy decreases. Okay? We'll see the importance of particularly the Gibbs free energy later when we talk about metabolic reactions. We focus on energy because energy is able to tell us directly whether a reaction goes forwards or whether it goes backwards. And that's a very important thing. The reason that's important is many of the reactions in our cells are reversible. In fact, most of the reactions in our cells are reversible. Our bodies break down glucose to get energy. Our bodies also have to make glucose to store energy for a future time. Our liver, for example, goes through a process called gluconeogenesis, making glucose for us. That's important because we're not eating, some of us are eating constantly, but we're not all of us are eating constantly. If we're eating constantly, then we have a constant supply of glucose in our bloodstream. But if we eat one or two meals a day, or perhaps we even skip a day where we eat a meal, we need to have the energy to keep us going. And our liver has got a little battery of glucose that it keeps because it makes glucose. The reactions that make glucose are very, very similar. In fact, in many cases, the reversal of the reactions that break down glucose. If we can predict which direction those reactions go, we know whether a cell is making glucose or breaking it down. That's very, very useful. Okay? And cells do it without even thinking. We have to understand that. OK. Oop. Oop. Now I'm stuck here. As you can see, I'm still learning the ropes here. OK. Now I'm going to turn our attention to some things that you will be responsible for. By the way, what I like to do in these classes, if I can, is I tend to get hot and bothered and tired after a while. And so I will try to leave at least a couple minute break uh, for every day in the, sort of the middle of the lecture so you can get a chance to stretch your legs and so forth, get a quick drink of water. I don't want to make those too long, so we'll try to be brief with them, but I will uh, go through them uh, as, as we have time. OK, now I'm going to start talking about things that you will be responsible for. So, I said we have to think about what happens in aqueous solutions. Water is a foundation of life. For everything we know about life, water is required. 70% to 90%, depending upon the cell, of the weight of the cell is comprised of water. Okay? Water is essential. We are bathed in water. And water has some very important properties that we have to understand. One of those is pH. pH is a measure of the hydrogen ion concentration. It is, in fact, the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration, as you can see on the top thing that I have placed right over here. Okay? The negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Okay? In freshman chemistry, you learn about pOH. Everybody learned about pOH, right? Okay? The pOH is the negative log of the hydroxide ion concentration. Well, water has the interesting property that the pH plus the pOH, if we add them together, will always equal 14. And that's because th there's a relationship between the protons and the hydroxides that we find in water. So there's your first equation, pH plus pOH equals 14. By the way, I don't require you to memorize equations. I will give you, on the exam, every equation you will need to know. You won't need to memorize a single equation. So you can write that down, maybe help you learn it, but you won't have to memorize any equations for the exam. 
Well, if the pH of a solution is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration and the pOH is the negative log of the hydroxide ion concentration, I like to say, what is the P. Kevin Ahern? It's the negative log of Kevin Ahern, right, of a solution, if such a thing existed. You can start to see the pattern, all right? The pKa, therefore, ex by extension, is the negative log of the Ka. We have to understand, therefore, what is the Ka. The Ka is described as the acid dissociation constant. And believe it or not, we're not actually going to use Ka in this class. The, K the pKa, we will. Now, I'll just tell you briefly that the Ka is a measure of the strength of an acid. The higher the Ka, the stronger the acid. The higher the Ka, the lower the pKa. So therefore, by extension, the lower the pKa of a given acid, the stronger the acid. If I have two acids, okay, I'll talk a lot in this class about acetic acid. Acetic acid has a pKa of 4.76. I'll explain to you what that means in a minute. A similar acid is, is formic acid. Formic acid has a pKa of 3.75. And no, you won't have to memorize any of those numbers either. I'll give them to you. Okay. If I were to compare the two and I say which is the stronger acid, you would say, well, formic acid is the stronger acid because it has a lower pKa. Now, what I've just described to you is pKa is a way for us to measure the strength of a weak acid. Notice I just described that as a weak acid. The strength of a weak acid. A weak acid is very different from a strong acid. Weak acids we find all the way through biology. Strong acids we don't find much in biology. Okay. Strong acids, and I want you to underline, if there's one thing I tell you in this first hour to underline, it's this. Strong acids do not have a pKa. The reason? Because they completely dissociate in aqueous solution. If I take HCl, and yes, HCl is a strong acid, and I put it into water, if I start with a million molecules of HCl, I will end up with a million molecules of H plus and a million molecules or atoms, whatever you want to call them, of Cl minus. It completely comes apart. There will be zero left in that solution as HCl. It ionizes 100%, meaning it comes apart. A weak acid doesn't do that. So the first thing I want you to understand is the difference between a weak acid and a strong acid. A weak acid does not come completely apart when you put it in water. Let's say I take some acetic acid. I like to abbreviate acetic acid as HAC. Okay? Here it is right here on the screen. Okay? For acetic acid, what you see is the dissociation of acetic acid. HAC, that's an equilibrium sign by the way, goes to proton plus AC minus. When I wrote that equation for HCl, I might as well have made that a one directional arrow because the HCl went completely to H plus and Cl minus. If I start with HAC, which is acetic acid, and I put it in water, okay, maybe one in a thousand will do what that equation shows you. Maybe one in a thousand will come apart. That's not very many. So if I start with a thousand molecules of HAC and I put it in water, 999 of them are going to remain as HAC. One of them is going to be a proton, and one of them is going to be an AC minus. Do you see the difference between a strong acid and a weak acid? Very big difference between them. Now it turns out that weak acids are essential for life as we know them, as we know it. The reason is because weak acids have the ability to resist changes in pH. pH changes are deadly. Your blood is able to resist changes in pH that happen as a result of living, that is metabolism, okay? 
it keeps your blood pH very, very close to 7.4. If you get even a tenth of a unit away from 7.4, you start having some very drastic effects for the organism. Being able to hold that pH relatively constant is a function of what weak acids do for us. So we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about weak acids and how they can help protect against changes in pH. Okay, questions about what I've said so far? Clear as mud? You guys are a quiet group. Okay. All right. Now, the next term I want to introduce to you are bases. And I'm very picky about bases because I find students get confused once we use the word. So we're only going to use the word base in this class to mean one thing. We're talking about strong bases. We're not going to use the term base for weak bases. And I'll tell you why in a second. So what's an example of a strong base? Well, sodium hydroxide is a strong base. And if we use the analogy to HCl, okay, what we discover, what we discover is that we don't have our cursor. There we go. Okay. NaOH completely dissociates when I put it in water. The OH part is the base because the OH can absorb protons. When I take and I add a proton to OH, I make our friend H2O. So bases absorb protons. We're only going to use that term for strong bases. NaOH is a prime example. If I take a thousand molecules of NaOH and I put it into water, I get a thousand sodiums and a thousand OHs. No NaOH is left behind. Completely dissociates, completely ionizes. It is, in fact, a strong base. Okay? Now, this brings us to a very, very important equation. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about this, and Anna uh, is going to spend some time talking about this equation in the recitation tomorrow. I'm going to talk about it today as well. It's an equation called the Henderson Hasselbach equation. How many people have heard of the Henderson Hasselbach equation? Okay, good. A few people have heard of it. The Henderson Hasselbach equation is a very important equation because it relates the pH of a solution to the pKa of the weak acid in the solution and the amount of salt and acid. Well, what's a salt? A salt is what you in the past have thought of as a weak base. We're not going to use that term. We're going to call it a salt. Now, in the scheme of things, the salt, okay, is right there where I have my cursor. The salt is AC minus. Well, think back to my original equation up here where I had HAC going to H plus and AC minus. Everybody see that? That told me what happened when I put that weak acid in solution. It told me that the weak acid went to a proton, which many of you are going to trip up and call the acid, and it's not. Okay? Acids give up protons. A proton is not an acid. Okay? It said that a weak acid, HAC, and yes, that's the acid part of it, gives up a proton and makes a salt. The AC minus is a salt. The difference between a weak acid and a salt is always, always, always a proton. The difference between a weak acid and a salt is a proton. The weak acid will always, always, always have one more proton than its corresponding salt. So in this equation right here where I talk about HAC, there's the proton. That's the weak acid. I look over here at the AC minus. It's lost a proton. It is, therefore, the salt. This equation says that the pH of a solution is equal to the pKa of the solution. Or not the pKa of the solution. Please, pKa of the buffer, in this case, acetic acid, plus the log of the concentration of the salt divided by the concentration of the weak acid. Now, there's a relationship between them. 
If I increase the amount of salt, what's going to happen to the pH? It's going to go up or going to go down? It's going to go up, right? Let me tell you something else that's very important about this equation. pKa for a given acid is a constant. The pKa of acetic acid is always 4.76. And yes, I'll give you that number on the exam. But it's always 4.76. Once I determine the pKa for an acid, it never changes. It's always the same. OK? The variables I have in this equation are pH, concentration of weak acid, and concentration of salt. As these change, they affect each other. This guy is a constant. Okay? The pKa is a constant. Okay, That is a good place to stretch our legs for a minute, I think, and uh, take a break, and then we'll dig into the next part. Water, is that what it is? <laughs> yeah.